Hello, in this video, we're gonna talk about pastoral assessment. So pastoral assessment, we can determine a lot about the state and function of muscles through pastoral assessment. So whatever modality it is that you might practice, whether it's um, like training, exercise, massage therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, chiropractic, you know, list goes on and on of different types of modalities that we might use to work with patients uh, to improve their function of muscles. And that could be for performance, that could be for rehabilitation or all sorts of other reasons. Um, so postural assessment is a great way to start to determine um, how some of those muscles are functioning so that you can determine how what kind of treatment plan is going to work the best to help improve that muscle function for this person. Um, so the, they might have back pain or ankle problems or who knows what they have, um, but it's hard to say what the cause is or what kind of treatment plan is going to solve the problem if we haven't done a thorough assessment to see how muscles are functioning, how joints are functioning, how connective tissue is functioning, uh, so that we know what we need to address in our treatment. Uh, so I wanna start by just mentioning the length tension relationship, and we're gonna get into this in more depth in a future lecture when we talk more about biomechanical principles. Uh, but for now, I just want to mention it um, because it has a significant effect on the function of muscles that we'll notice when we're doing posture assessments. So the length tension relationship states that the amount of tension a sarcomere can generate when stimulated to contract is directly related to the length or the amount of overlap of the filaments of the sarcomere. Okay, so I'm gonna break that down. Um, think back to sarcomeres back in muscle physiology. Uh, you've got your sarcomere that has the filaments that kind of overlap like this. And then when we have a signal to contract, we form cross bridges between those filaments and it causes the filaments to overlap more during the contraction. And then when they relax and let go, then they're able to come back apart again. So what the length tension relationship is saying is that there's an optimal amount of overlap to produce an optimal amount of force. If we have too much overlap to begin with, then when there's a signal to contract, there's nowhere to go. So we don't produce more force because the sarcomeres aren't able to shorten in, in contraction. If we don't have enough overlap, then when we have a signal to contract, then we can't form cross bridges because they're not the filaments aren't engaging, they're not interacting. So there's an optimal amount of overlap where we can form cross bridges and have room to, to contract. So that's what the length tension relationship is stating. And in this graph we see on the left, we can see that there's that optimal amount of overlap kind of somewhere in the middle. And in the bottom of our, our little graph here, it shows kind of a, a picture of what a sarcomere might look like in that position where we have a moderate amount of overlap, and then we have significantly less force production going in either direction, all the way down to zero, uh, where we have too much overlap to begin with or not enough overlap to begin with. Okay, so that's what the length tension relationship is saying. Um, so reduced capacity for force production when we have too much overlap. So in practical terms in our muscles, that would be like a chronically shortened muscle. It's like a hypertonic muscle or a muscle that's chronically shortened um, where it's overworking and, and doesn't really relax enough or, or extend to its, its full length frequently enough. And it'll maintain kind of that shortened sarcomere, too much overlap state. And so that's going to make that muscle less capable of producing force because when we do have a signal for contraction, there isn't room for those sar sarcomeres to shorten further. And then on the flip side, we'll have muscles that are chronically lengthened or chronically sort of stretched out. Uh, so muscles in the body that aren't activating sufficiently, uh, they're hypotonic, they're not activating at a normal or sufficient level. And so they're getting kind of stretched out and they're getting longer. Um, and in that case, our sarcomeres are more like the picture on the right there where there isn't enough overlap. And so when we get a signal to contract, they're not overlapping enough to be able to cause the sarcomere to shorten and produce an adequate amount of force. 
So that's part of what we're observing in a postural assessment is we're seeing muscles that are chronically shortened and muscles that are chronically lengthened. And that is going to affect those muscles ability to generate sufficient force. So we have all kinds of muscle imbalances that we might observe um, doing postural assessments. So there's, we could have muscles that are weak, muscles that are in spasm, um, disproportionate strength relationships. Like you see that a lot. Like I'm sure most of us know somebody who um, always wants to work out and do pecs and biceps, you know, the show muscles. <laughs> um, you know, so somebody who just wants to go to the gym and do pecs and biceps and is ignoring their back muscles and ignoring triceps and legs and uh, that person ends up with disproportionate strength relationships where they might be over strengthening their pecs and they end up with this kind of rolled in shoulder posture um, because they're ignoring their posterior muscles and their back muscles. And so you end up with really strong anterior, really weak posterior. So that's just one example, but that can happen for a lot of different reasons. Uh, there also could be abnormal neurological input. So there could be um, all, all sorts of different neurological conditions or conditions of nerves, injuries to nerves. Um, it could really just be a matter of hypertonicity or hypotonicity. So not enough uh, activation or too, mu or too much. Um, and that we can have a significant effect on with training and massage and electric stim and all sorts of different modalities. Um, and then we could also have abnormal length tension relationships, again, where we have chronically shortened or chronically lengthened muscles that are not able to produce uh, optimal force. So different patterns of activity are displayed depending on whether a muscle is postural or phasic. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about next here. So postural and phasic muscles. Postural muscles are muscles that support the body against gravity. Um, so their job is to support us against gravity, support us in postures that we need to maintain for long stretches of time. Uh, so they have a higher proportion of slow twitch muscle fibers that make them up because those are our endurance fibers that are able to support us over long periods of time. Um, so no muscle in the body is made of all of one type of muscle fiber. All muscles are a blend of a whole spectrum of different types of muscle fibers, but some will have greater proportions of one type than another. Okay, so postural muscles in general have a higher proportion of slow twitch because they need to be able to endure and act for much longer, um, but with less force and speed necessarily. So uh, phasic muscles um, tend to require greater speed and greater force of contraction. Um, those are the primary movers of the limbs. Uh, so those are going to have a higher proportion of fast twitch fibers compared to postural muscles. How that affects posture and um, injury and, and things like that, uh, postural muscles have a greater tendency to become hypertonic so too much muscle tone, too much activation, more chronically shortened. Uh, so they have a greater tendency to become hypertonic and shortened in response to stresses or pain. So with stress or pain or too much use um, over time, like an overuse type injury or um, movement pattern, they will tend to become hypertonic and shortened over time. And we'll see that when we do postural assessments. And then phasic muscles, um, they have a greater tendency toward tears and tendinopathies. So uh, dysfunction and injuries to the tendons and tears of the muscle or the tendon. Uh, so phasic muscles respond generally differently to increased stress, pain, uh, overuse, that sort of thing, than do phasic muscles. Okay, joint kinematics. So we need to restore normal joint kinematics to correct a postural deviation. So when we have postural deviation, it means that our joints are not moving the way they're supposed to. Um, and that could be because there's one rogue joint that's doing things incorrectly and all the others um, have to move incorrectly to make up for it. Um, 
So we need to restore our normal joint kinematics to resolve whatever postural deviation or compensation is happening. Uh, chronically shortened or hypertonic muscles need to be elongated. And again, there are many modalities we can use to make all of these types of corrections. So chronically shortened or hypertonic muscles, um, if we strength train and move through full range of motion, that tends to help hypertonic muscles to lengthen uh, because you're actively using those muscles through their full range of motion, uh, which is usually well beyond uh, whatever its current range of motion is because it's chronically shortened. Um, we also can use stretching in that scenario. I personally wouldn't recommend it in that scenario because stretching a chronically hypertonic or shortened muscle might cause that muscle to resist and become even tighter and more activated rather than less. Um, stretching, um, it, it may not help in this situation. To some extent it might, but it might actually cause that muscle to resist and become even more hypertonic. So what I would recommend instead of trying to pull the muscle apart is, like I mentioned, to activate it and use the muscle, but use it in a wider range of motion so that it becomes more functional outside of its very narrow range. We want it to become functional out here in its much broader range. And so that's a really good way to do that. Um, other modalities like massage therapy or foam rolling or other things um, also can, can certainly help to uh, lengthen a shortened muscle or reduce hypertonicity. I just wouldn't re recommend therapies where we're stretching the muscle. Um, and we'll get into more principles of how muscles work and why, why that is exactly. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that. But foam rolling, massage therapy, and strength training through proper range of motion is great for that. Uh, chronically lengthened or hypotonic muscles need to be strengthened. So that's very obvious. Strength training is a great solution there. Um, and it could be strength training, like a full program, um, or that could be like uh, corrective exercises where we're selecting very specific exercises to strengthen the specific muscles that are hypotonic to correct the posture or movement pattern. Um, but in any case, we want to strengthen those muscles. Uh, movement is passively restrained by joint capsules, ligaments, and fascial webbing. So those are all examples of connective tissue. So we have connective tissue throughout the body that is restraining our movement passively. Actively would be like muscle and tendon that contracts and actively can um, change our movement. Um, but the connective tissue of the body acts as passive restraints. So if the connective tissue is stiffening or hardening, that will restrict our normal muscle function and our normal movement and joint kinematics. Um, so connective tissue in general should be pliable. It should be soft and somewhat gelatinous. Um, but with, um, if we're too sedentary or we might have certain injuries and things, that could cause the connective tissue to stiffen up and, and become tougher, harder, more dense. Um, and in that case, that connective tissue is going to more um, restrain our movement of our joints and muscles. So in some cases, it's the connective tissue's fault that we're having abnormal postures or abnormal movements, and we need to kind of soften up and, and return the connective tissue to its normal, healthy, sort of gelatinous state. Uh, so heat and pressure are the best ways to do that. Um, so heat therapies like um, sauna, steam room, baths, um, hot pads, hot towels, things like that. Uh, heat therapies help and pressure. So like massage therapy, foam rolling, things like that. And something like massage offers both, both the heat of the hands and the friction of the work that you're doing is the heat and the pressure of uh, the massage that's being applied. Uh, so there are different ways to kind of combine both that heat and pressure, but um, that is going to significantly help to soften and relax that connective tissue and allow for more free movement. Distortion of fascia, again, that's connective tissue, can affect the function of muscles and healthy posture. 
So when that fascia becomes distorted, like it becomes stiffer or less uh, movable in certain areas of the body, it can sort of pull on the fascial webbing of the body, which is kind of what I'm showing here in this picture. You know, we have this fascial web covering the entire body. And when it starts to get pulled in one little area, it will distort the whole web. And so that will distort posture and it'll distort movement patterns. Um, and it can cause pain and um, blood flow restriction in different parts of the body. And so that is important that we correct that. Um, a lot of the pain that we experience in general, like bodily somatic pain, a lot of the times is from not enough blood flow, uh, ischemia. So ischemia is actually a very, very common cause of somatic pain, which is why exercise makes it feel better, stretching makes it feel better, massage makes it feel better, um, because those are things that are helping to improve and restore blood flow. Well, when fascia is dense or hardened or restrictive, it's very commonly restricting blood flow to different parts of the body, wherever that hardness is. And so if we can soften that fascia, we help restore the blood flow and that will significantly reduce pain um, for a lot of people. If that was the problem, if it's lack of blood flow, then that will help significantly. Okay, so then postural assessment, how we actually do it. Um, so, we talked in the beginning of this course about qualitative and quantitative motion analysis. Well, posture and gait assessment, we can also perform qualitatively and quantitatively. So qualitatively, uh, it's not a perfect science. Uh, we have different tools that we can use to assist us during qualitative postural assessment. Uh, so like a plumb line, for example, that's what we see in the picture on the left here. It's as simple as it gets. It's a piece of stream, string with something heavy hanging from the bottom. Uh, and you just hang it from the ceiling or in a door frame or something. You mount it somewhere and just let it hang. And because there's something heavy hanging from the bottom, it gets the string to hang in a perfect vertical line. Um, that could be really helpful with postural assessments because it helps give you a visual of the, the vertical line of gravity. Um, so I'll talk more as we go through the different um, views when we're doing postural assessments about where to put the plumb line. Uh, but it's a very, very simple tool. Uh, we'll use them in class. It's something you could whip up at home by yourself. You just need a piece of string and anything heavy you can tie to the bottom of it. Uh, and you've got your own plumb line. Uh, goniometer is what you see in that top picture there. It's just really inexpensive, really easy to use, like five bucks on Amazon. Uh, it's just like a, it's two pieces of plastic that as you can see are, are kind of hinged together. Um, and so you can use that to measure joint angles. So it's a way to quantify joint angles while you're doing a qualitative postural assessment. Um, it's also really helpful when you're doing postural assessment to palpate the relevant landmarks while you're observing. Uh, so you're observing the body and we'll go through all the things that we should be observing, but it's very helpful if you actually palpate and touch the landmarks as you go. Um, some things are visually more difficult to see, especially depending on body type. Um, people might have more or less body fat or they might be wearing more or less clothing that make it more difficult to to see the landmarks that we're assessing. And so palpating them is a really great way to do that. Um, and in class for your project, I'll have you palpate and then you can actually put the stickers right on the landmarks so that when you take videos while you're doing your assessment, you'll be able to see the stickers that mark the different landmarks. Uh, so I highly recommend doing that in general, um, that if you're gonna take pictures or videos to assess posture or gait later on, it's very helpful to have already marked the landmarks that you're observing. Uh, it helps you determine the relative location of landmarks to validate or refute other observational findings during assessment. Um, so you'll, there's lots of different aspects of assessment. You might do posture, gait, um, movement analysis of other types of movements that someone uses in their sport. Um, you might do muscle assessment where you're testing the, the function of specific muscles. You might do orthopedic testing. So assessment can include lots of different aspects and steps. And so you might find all different findings in those different versions or aspects of your assessment. 
And if you've marked landmarks and have pictures or uh, have done a really thorough qualitative postural assessment, that will help you to um, interpret the findings of some of your other assessments. So it'll help you to narrow down uh, what might be going on and to refute your findings or to confirm your findings. Um, so posture is usually assessed in a standing or seated position depending on the person and what we're looking for. Um, but we can assess posture in any position because again, posture doesn't just mean this sitting up straight sort of thing. Pos uh, posture is any position of the body. And so depending on the person and what sports they play or what activities they participate in, you might want to assess all different kinds of posture. Um, so you might determine relevant postures to this person by talking to them and finding out uh, what positions are they holding for long periods of time? What kind of activities do they engage in? And do any of them produce symptoms that you're, you're trying to explore? Um, what postures do they hold during activities of daily living? Like, you know, maybe they're, they're standing, they're shifting their weight towards one foot while they brush their teeth, or they're sitting in a weird twisted position while they're driving, things like that. Uh, what positions do they sleep in? Um, do they have a new job or a new activity that they're, they're engaging in that maybe is causing a new problem or dysfunction that they didn't have before? Um, so you want to discuss with this person and find out what other relevant postures they might have in their lives that you might want to assess in addition to or instead of just a normal standing posture. So I included this here of a horseback rider because I've actually had several horseback riding uh, clients that have come to me over the years with with various issues like ankle issues from being in uh, extreme dorsiflexion while they're riding for so long or wrist issues hip issues because of the hip positions um, back issues especially with the the bouncing of the horse um, so these are all things to consider I've had um, horseback riding clients whose shoulders hurt and what it came down to was that they were lifting the saddle and then doing this kind of twisting motion, lifting it up over their heads and, and hanging it on a rack. And that was causing shoulder and spine issues with that twist and lift um, frequently. And maybe it was a little too heavy for what their, their body really could tolerate and they were doing it too many times. Um, so those are things you find out through discussion and getting to know the person, and then you can assess how they're moving or how they're standing based on what is relevant to that person instead of just that standing or seated posture. Okay, so when we're doing our postural assessment, um, you want the person to wear as minimal clothing as is possible or as they feel comfortable with. Uh, that'll be different for different populations and in different contexts. Uh, so if they're comfortable wearing like a bathing suit or a sports bra and shorts or leggings or whatever it is that they're comfortable with, um, it's, it really depends on the person and on you and on what environment you're doing this in. Uh, but the less someone is wearing and the more you're able to see their skin and their body, uh, the, the more visible their landmarks will be and the easier and maybe more accurate your postural assessment will be. If they're wearing, if they're very covered up and they're wearing a lot of clothing, um, then you can palpate and find those landmarks uh, and you can mark them with stickers and things. But the thing is the clothes will move on against the skin. So wherever you marked landmarks on clothing may not really be that accurate once they've moved around a little bit. Um, so something to consider. So it's, it's, we're going to be more accurate and easier to perform with less clothing. Um, but again, you need to work within the person's comfortability and the environment that you're doing this work in. Um, you can, I always recommend assessing posture without shoes because you want to see how the person's body works and functions aside from their shoes. Um, but there are many scenarios where you'll want to also assess posture with shoes. So you might wanna see how their posture changes when they are wearing their cleats, or maybe you're comparing two pairs of shoes to see which ones are better for that person's body. Or maybe you're comparing um, when they're wearing their orthotics or not. Uh, so there are lots of reasons where we might want to assess with shoes, but I would say as whenever it's possible or comfortable for the person, you should always assess also without shoes.
for your projects, I'm going to ask you to assess without shoes. Um, and if you have, unless you have a good reason or argument for why you should assess with shoes. Uh, it's most ideal to assess posture without the person really knowing it. Um, that's not always possible, but if you can, you know, watch how the person is sitting, watch how they're moving uh, when you're, you know, doing intake with them. Like if, if it's a new client and you're doing an intake or you're discussing what their life is like or what their goals are, or why they're working with you, uh, you can observe a lot about the person's posture and gait um, just while you're going through that process. So gain as much information, as many observations as you can during that process. Um, but very often you're still going to want to do like a formal posture and gait assessment. Um, so when they know that they're being assessed, um, if they seem really stiff or like they're trying to have good posture, get them to loosen up, ask them to march in place, wiggle around, dance, um, whatever they need to do to loosen up and then just kind of freeze in neutral. Um, that's where you want to assess them. You don't want to assess their most perfect, uh, like pressed position. You want to assess their natural neutral position. Postural sway is another element of posture that we want to observe when uh, either when we're just doing intake procedures and that sort of thing, or uh, formally as part of our postural assessment. Uh, that's the continual displacement and return of the center of gravity over the base of support. So all of us, we all have a little bit of sway to us when we're standing or sitting. That's part of what makes us look alive and human. Uh, if you think about like, <laughs> like what makes a robot really look not human is that they're absolutely still. <laughs> I don't know if any of you watch Westworld. I do, we love it. Uh, but it's, they're very lifelike human looking robots but if they aren't moving at all, it's very creepy. They're just incredibly still. And what's missing is their postural sway. So postural sway is just that normal, natural bit of sway that we all have. So that's normal, healthy, natural sway. Uh, we're never completely still because we are not robots. Um, but we can observe postural sway because if it's too extreme, like there's a lot of postural sway, or they're kind of tilting in one direction, like there's more sway in one direction than the other, then that can indicate that there's some kind of balance dysfunction, like there could be some kind of inner ear thing going on or a cerebellar thing going on, um, or it could be insufficiency of postural muscles, so like postural muscles that are not strong enough to maintain um, normal posture. So there's a lot that we can learn there if there's excessive postural sway. Okay, we need to consider body type when we look at posture. So posture is related to body type um, because how we interpret our findings of our postural assessment might be different depending on what their overall body type is. Um, so we might expect joints to be in certain place for one body type and in a different place for another. So an ectomorph body type is someone who is slender, has a minimal thin muscle build, uh, relatively low body mass index usually, um, and that person will usually have increased joint mobility, so like more hypermobility of joints. And the flip side of hypermobility of joints would be also that they have decreased joint stability. Those two things go hand in hand. Um, more mobility means less stability. A uh, mesomorph is someone who's kind of in between. They have more of a medium athletic muscle build, um, usually more of an average body mass index and more average joint mobility and stability. And then the endomorph person is the other extreme, uh, more of a stocky build with thick muscle mass, usually more of a relatively high body mass index. And they have the opposite. They have decreased joint mobility and increased joint stability. Again, mobility and stability are opposites. The more mobility we have, the less stability we have and vice versa. Now, most people don't fit just cleanly into one of these categories. Some people do, um, but of course there are all different body types that can be on any sliding scale, some blend of these things. So uh, this is not absolute or black and white, but it's just a way to sort of classify body types. Um, but obviously there's an infinite blend of these body types that exist in the world. 
All right, it's important to compare structures bilaterally. So when we're assessing anything, you know, so posture or assessing individual joints or whatever it is that we're assessing, we want to look at left and right sides. I included this picture because if we just looked at that left ankle, we don't know if that's normal for this person. That could be like joint swelling, like maybe this is someone who, um, it could be a pregnant woman, this could be someone who has severe arthritis, this could be a number of different things that could lead to kind of this excessive swelling in uh, the ankles. And we don't know if this is normal for this person or why this is happening. Uh, but when we look at both sides, without knowing anything about this person, clearly we can see that there's a serious problem on the left side when we compare it to their right. Um, so on the right side, you can see the Achilles is well outlined and defined. And on the left, the problem is that they've ruptured their Achilles tendon. That's why we can't see it anymore. It's been ruptured. So we no longer have that clear definition of the Achilles. And instead, we have all of this swelling that's happened because of the injury. Okay, so this is just a very clear example of why bilateral comparison is really important. Um, but whenever you're doing assessment, postural assessment, gait assessment, joint assessment, any of that, always look at left and right because you'll be able to see what their normal is and is it balanced, is it symmetrical, even if it's a problem, maybe it's symmetrical, so it's maybe less of a problem. Or if it's asymmetrical, that might give you a clue about what caused it or where to start. So it's an important part of assessment. So are left and right in the same location? Um, do they look the same? Uh, consider side dominance because if someone is very left or right dominant, um, they're going to have some asymmetries. Even if they have no dysfunctions and everything is healthy and working properly, someone who's very dominant in one side is absolutely going to have bilateral imbalances. And it won't necessarily hurt them or be a problem, but you will absolutely observe those in someone who's very dominant. Um, someone who's less dominant will have less of those imbalances and will be a little bit more equal side to side. Uh, left and right differences might be totally benign. Again, like someone might just be very side dominant or in a sport, they might be very side dominant in that sport. Uh, like in softball players or in different sports where you're doing certain actions to one direction all the time and never doing it to the other side, um, there will be a, a significant imbalance left to right, but that may or may not be a problem. Uh, it might be okay, or it might be something that leads to dysfunction um, or predisposes that person to injuries in the future because they're so uh, prone to movement on one side or the other. All right, so how we actually hands-on do the assessment. So lateral assessment, um, we hang the plumb line, we get the person to stand behind the plumb line so that the plumb line is hanging down, they can't touch it. Once they touch it, it'll wiggle all over for a long time and you have to wait. So don't touch the plumb line, let it hang. And you start by lining it up, position the plumb line from the bottom up. So look at the feet and position the plumb line so it's just anterior to the lateral malleolus. Okay, so the big bump, the big bony, prominence on the side of the ankle. So just anterior to the lateral malleolus. And then just have the person stand neutrally and relaxed and see all the way up the chain where the plumb line matches up. Okay, so in the most efficient posture for most people, uh, the plumb line would line up through the ear and the mastoid process back here, slightly anterior to the glenohumeral joint slightly posterior to the acetabulofemoral joint in the greater trochanter, slightly posterior to the center of the knee, and slightly anterior to the front of the ankle. So to assess the person, line them up with the front of the ankle, and then see how everything stacks up from there. Okay, if you're otherwise, you know, we're trying to see what lines up and what doesn't. And so if you start anywhere else trying to line up that plumb line, then you don't know, like, is it because the head's too far forward or are the hips too far back? Like, it's really hard to figure that out. So if you start with the feet and then see what is anterior and posterior, that's gonna give you the most accurate way to measure. Um, so in a lateral position, what some of the things we're looking for, in addition to just how does everything line up top to bottom, are the weight-bearing articulations extended and anteriorly facing, 
or, you know, if in the lateral position, we'll be able to see like, are the elbows significantly flexed or the shoulders significantly flexed, that sort of thing. Uh, is the head aligned with the body, which we get from the plumb line. Um, and the writing reflex, it's the natural tendency of the body to keep the head level with the horizon and forward facing to optimize vision. Um, so no matter how we move, we have a tendency to move our head so that it stays upright and our vision stays level with the horizon. So when all, like if my posture is poor, let's say my shoulders are drifting forward, instead of me now looking at the floor, the writing reflex, reflex will have me look up and stay level with the horizon. So that's kind of what we're seeing in this picture in the background here. On the left, that's a normal neutral position. And then on the middle and on the right, we see the head drifting further and further forward. So it's not just flexing forward, it's drifting forward because of the writing reflex. And this is something we can see really significantly in the lateral view of the assessment. So as the head drifts forward, the cervical spine is required to arch upward to keep the eyes level with the horizon because of the writing reflex. So also in the lateral assessment, we're looking at the pelvis, so the ASIS and the PSIS. Uh, so we need to see their position relative to one another. So in the lateral position, you can palpate the ASIS and the PSIS and see where they are compared to one another. Uh, in a normal posture, there should be about an eight to 10 degree angle between the ASIS and the PSIS where the ASIS is lower. Um, you can measure that with a goniometer, like that little plastic tool I showed a little while ago, and you can measure that in dart fish, which is what we're gonna use for your postural assessment project. Okay, so the ASIS should be about eight to 10 degrees lower than the PSIS, and it should be about the same on both sides, so it should be symmetrical. So if the angle is less than eight degrees, that means you have a posterior tilt, and if it's greater than 10 degrees, that means there's an anterior pelvic tilt. All right, and then moving to the anterior view. Um, so for both the anterior and posterior assessments, get the person to stand behind the plumb line and aim for the plumb line to be equidistant between the feet. So again, we're not trying to line it up with the nose or the sternum. We're not trying to line it up with anything along the body. Look at the feet and try to get the plumb line equidistant between the feet when the person's in a neutral, um, kind of relaxed standing position, equidistant between the feet. And then you can see how the body stacks up. Are they shifting their weight to one side or the other? So now the plumb line is not in the center of the body. Um, and also it helps give you a really clear visual of like, is one side elevated or depressed or um, whatever it might be. It gives you a really clear visual. Uh, so you look at the patellas, see if they're symmetrical. Um, you can palpate and put your thumb and index finger on either side of the patellas and see like, are they rotated? Is one rotated and the other isn't? Is one more lateral than the other? Um, so pinch them with your fingers. So you can see, especially if they're wearing pants because you can't see. Um, and so you can sort of pinch them or mark them with stickers and then do your videos or your pictures. Um, so you want to see if the patellas are in the right place. So are they the same height, same distance laterally, same amount of rotation. Uh, then you want to look at the iliac crest and the ASIS heights. So both the, the height of the iliac crest and the ASIS, and you can mark those with stickers and palpate and see, are they equal on left and right? Like is one side higher than the other? Does it look like one is more anterior than the other side? Um, are the lateral malleoli of the ankles, the prominent bumps in the ankles, are they and are the acromion processes up in the shoulders equal height and look like they're in the same position left and right? Okay, posterior, again, aim the, um, the plumb line to be equidistant between the feet. And then you're checking, um, are the PSIS locations of equal heights bilaterally? So you'll palpate those, the PSIS. It's like right where the sacroiliac joint is. You can put stickers there or um, you know, mark it in some way if you're doing videos and pictures. Um, so palpate those. You want to look is the spinal column aligned so the spinal column should line up with your plumb line 
depending on if you're shifted to the left or right on your feet. Um, but it should roughly line up. And if you can see the spine or palpate the spine, you should be able to palpate or see if the spinous processes are roughly in line. Um, so you might observe, if they're not, you might observe a little bit of scoliosis, some uh, lateral bending there. Or there might be a little bit of bend because they're shifting their hips or doing something else. The problem isn't always in the spinal alignment. Sometimes um, it's the rest of the body and how they're standing or moving. Uh, you want to look at the scapulas and the scapular position. So you want to see, are they symmetrical on both sides? Are they in the same position? Are they in the same orientation? Like is one rotated more than the other? Are they at the same height? Is there any scapular winging? Like if we have um, dysfunction of uh, serratus anterior, if we have weakness or a nerve dysfunction or something uh, that causes serratus anterior to allow the medial borders of the scapulas to pop up. So we need to see, our, do we have scapular winging? If we do, is it on both sides or just one? Um, and I wanna mention it is totally normal for the scapula of the dominant side to be a little bit protracted. So on the dominant side, like I'm a righty, and the, my right scapula is more likely to be a little bit further protracted, probably because I'm, my arm is out in front of me and I'm using this arm significantly more than my left arm. Um, so it's normal and healthy and that's okay. Um, you can work to reduce that, that difference left and right uh, through strengthening corrective exercise, um, but it is okay for it to be a little bit more protracted. Um, at rest, the superior angles of the scapula should be at about the level of T3, T4. Um, so when you're assessing, you know, it might look like everything's fine. You know, the first time you do this, especially, you look at the scapulas and say, well, I don't know, they look okay to me. Um, because maybe they're symmetrical, they're at the same orientation, all of that. Um, but you, to know if they're in the right place on the back, try to palpate and find T3, T4. Um, and then the, the scapulas should be at about that level. So if they're much above that or much below that, then we would say that the scapulas are elevated or depressed bilaterally. So that would be on both sides. Okay, so that's all I have for you on postural assessment. And I will see you for our next video. Bye.